Okay. Hello everyone, my name's Alexander. I'm visiting from Australia. I brought over two of my Arrogate Lego models, which are exhibited uh, on display behind this, opposite behind that big green locomotive over there. And just before I start telling you about talking about Lego, I just want to tell you very briefly about the Victorian narrow gauge, which my models are all based around. So in the 1890s, basically the rolling back of Victoria looked something like this. Uh, a bit earlier in 1884, the government had passed a Railway Construction Act, which had authorised the construction of a huge number of, of railway lines, which was coming out all over the state, and that Government Act got the, the nickname the Octopus Act, because it covered so many lines. All the lines, unlike in Britain, were government owned, uh, but the government was still looking for ways to build cheaper railways. There were still many towns around Victoria that were clamouring for a railway line. So the Victorian Government looked to Wales, where narrow gauge lines had been used, particularly to service the slate industry, and thought that might be a cheaper way to build railway lines rather than the broad gauge of 5 foot 3 that the uh, railways had been using up to that point. So as an experiment, and against the advice of the Victorian railways that were, were running the network, the government decided to build four narrow gauge lines. They were all built to 2 foot 6 inch gauge, um, but, but they were never particularly profitable. Although they were cheaper to construct, the cost of transshipping all the freight where they met the broad gauge lines outweighed any savings. So by the, by the 50s and 60s, all the lines had been closed. Now, when the Puffing Billy Railway, which is, runs from just, just outside of Melbourne, when the railways closed out, a preservation society was formed, basically following the same model as the Talifin Society from Wales, and they persuaded the railways to reopen the line as a tourist railway. And this is actually the first preserved railway to be re reopened outside of Britain, and probably, I think, only the third one in the world. So today, Puffing Billy runs every day of the year as a daily steam service, and is predominantly operated by volunteers. And being one of those volunteers, when I found my childhood Lego sitting in the garage about four years ago, I pulled it down for a bit of look, first thing I thought was I'll just try and build a puffing belly locomotive. Now being narrow gauge, we need the track to be narrower than normal. So one way to achieve that is to build the models bigger. So basically I built all my locomotives to a lot about twice the size, twice the width. So they're 12, instead of being six studs wide, which is the sort of standard for Lego trains, these are 12 studs wide. So when I first started, I got my 60s and 70s, oh sorry, 70s and 80s Lego, and this is what I came up with. So this is basically built all using old bricks that existed when I was growing up. But it didn't take me long to find out about Bricklink, where you can order any bricks you like, in all the new colours and all the new shapes that have, have become available in the last few years. So it wasn't long before I was on there and ordered the parts to make a new locomotive in green. Uh, using a lot more curved elements that weren't available back then. And from there the models sort of have evolved. So the white lining that you can see on there, the white stripe, that's made using vinyl, uh, using a computer controlled vinyl cutter. Uh, so you can cut out a fine white stripe, whatever design you like. And stepping up from there, this is now a basically a dark green Lego locomotive with, a, with white and green vinyl applied over the top to give it the full uh, authentic uh, colour scheme. So the locomotives we're looking at here are the NA class tank engines that are synonymous with Bucking Billy. The railways ordered two of these from Baldwin in the United States when Puffing Brindley four narrow gauge lines were first opened. They also ordered a kit of spare parts and promptly used those spare parts to build two more engines and then went on to build another 13 locomotives just copying Baldwin's design. And there's not actually any particular evidence that they paid any royalties to Baldwin uh, having, got, having happily used their design for all their engines. In the 20s they were looking for something more powerful so they 
Um, so they ordered two Garrett locomotives from Manchester. So they were the next locom that was the next locomotive that I've modelled, and that one is also on display in the hall behind us. Another unusual locomotive is a Climax, uh, which is from an American manufacturer. This is a, actually a gear locomotive, so the wheels at the front and back are, are actually on separate bogies, and, uh, and it's a gear drive to them, uh, which made them like, very powerful, although very slow. And this was used by the Forest Commission in Victoria to open up a, to pull timber out of, on a uh, timber tramway that connected with one of the narrow gauge lines in Victoria. And finally, we've got one of our more modern diesel locomotives that we use on Puffing Billy today when the weather's too hot for us to run steam locomotives. I had built locomotives, I needed somewhere to run them, so I started building some scenery. And of course, what I hadn't really realised when I was building at that scale is that it's sort of okay to build locomotives and carriages, but then when you start building scenery, everything is very, very big takes up an awful lot of space. So when I started, I had it fairly simple and basically just had a timber framework and then a fairly small amount of Lego built on top, top of that. So that was the first layout which I was exhibited at in Melbourne, Victoria, the first year that I, uh, or actually the second year that I was exhibiting there. But from there, it's kind of growing each year and unfortunately it's a bit too large to bring here, hiring something like a small small van to transport, so it really wasn't possible to pack it onto an aircraft to bring over here. So I'm afraid all I can show you some photographs of what it does look like when, it's, when the full layout is, uh, is set up. This section of the layout is based on the Walhalla Railway in Victoria, which opened up a gold mining town. And the town had been clamouring for their railway line for many years, but the railway line, line arrived just as the gold ran out. So basically, we arrived just in time to take away all the miners and, all, and half the, the buildings in the town. And once again, another view looking along the, uh, this, rail, this section. The, uh, it's a very hilly area of Victoria, right? and the whole railway line had to be built on, the well, last section of the railway line had to be built on bridges, basically leapfrogging back and forth across a, a uh, river gorge as it made its way into the town because there was just not enough, enough level ground to uh, build a railway on. But the other problem with building this scale is what to do about figures, since the uh, mini figs are way too, uh, way too small for my models. Uh, my current solution, which is not completely ideal, is to use the maxi figs, which Lego made back in the uh, 70s. So the maxi figs are adults and then the mini figs can be used as children. Now, when I was first trying to uh, power the locomotives, uh, I was basically trying to use the Lego power functions, uh, which is the current system that they have. So it's a plastic track, uh, motors, batteries, uh, and infrared controller. So I put a motor in one of the locomotives, I put a couple of motors under one of the carriages for extra power, and thought that would be okay. But when I tried to uh, exhibit this, I found out that it didn't actually work very well. Uh, for starters, it was chewing through the uh, batteries at quite an alarming rate. And the other problem was that with the, the large amount of weight that it was pushing around, uh, you know, it kept on overloading the infrared receiver, which has a fairly low threshold before it cuts out. So the uh, effect, which was uh, mildly comical, at least for people watching, was that the locomotive would keep running around, but the rest of the train would keep on uh, stopping when the infrared receiver and the carriage overloaded. It would then sit there for a few seconds, then would reset, and then the carriage would tear off at a huge speed, bash into the back of the locomotive, overload, stop again, the locomotive would sort of take off again if it didn't derail, the carriage wakes up again, runs around, bashes into the locomotive again. So that was not so successful. So after that, I had to find a way to power them with mains power. And um, growing up in the, 70, in the 70s and 80s, I had some of the old Lego 12 volt track. So basically what I've done is the, take the Lego power rails that they made back then and fit them inside the modern plastic track that Lego uses today. Did require a little bit of modification of the parts. Uh, and in fact that inside pit has been 
uh, kind of cut in half to fit inside the, uh, the two uh, flexible track pieces. And um, going through points, a few uh, tiles got sacrificed to make a smooth transition through the uh, points so the power contacts don't get stuck in the points. So if there's any purists here who don't approve of cutting things, then I'm sorry, but it gets slightly modified. Now, conveniently, LEGO actually made a power pickup piece back at the very early LEGO motors when this actually clipped underneath the motor. So I'm able to attach that underneath my models. The other problem with the size of my locomotives is that they are basically too long to go around the standard Lego curve. And even if I could get them around the Lego curve, it would be an awful lot of strain on the motors to go around very sharp corners. So my solution is basically to alternate with a straight piece of track, then a half curve and another straight. And that provides an easy, a gentle enough curve to, uh, for them to negotiate reasonably happily. This is what the uh, locomotive looks like from underneath. Uh, and hopefully see in the middle there.